All right, so yeah, we're just gonna go ahead and start off. Um, we've got several steps to take you through today. So firstly, what is Amazon KDP? Just to clarify for any of you who maybe are new to this or maybe you're just a little bit unclear. So KDP stands for Kindle Direct Publishing. It's just Amazon's backend platform that allows you to self-publish your own books and then obviously get them for sale on Amazon's platform. So you can publish eBooks, paperbacks, and hardbacks. Um, and the best part about Amazon KDP or one of the best things about it in our opinion is that they have their print on demand model. So if you don't already know what this is, I mean, it is exactly what it sounds like, but anytime somebody actually buys one of your books, they then print it and ship it off for you. So yeah, it's just quite hands-off in that sense. So next up, what is Audible ACX? So ACX stands for Audiobook Creation Exchange. It's the largest audiobook platform in the world. It currently has a 63.4% market share, uh, but actually some estimates suggest it's actually a bit bigger than that. So ACX is essentially Audible's back-end platform that allows you to convert books into audiobooks. So Amazon has KDP and Audible has ACX. So on ACX's platform, there are literally hundreds of narrators to actually narrate your book. So you don't have an issue finding a narrator to narrate your um, audiobook. All right, so let's just quickly talk about the different types of books. So obviously you've got your fiction books. So these are going to be like your story books, your fantasy novels, your romance novels, your thriller novels, that sort of thing. And then you've got your nonfiction books. So these are going to be obviously anything like informational, how-to sort of DIY type books. Um, and then you've got your low, medium, and high content books. So low content books are things like your journals, your notebooks, planners, things that, as it sounds, um, you know, have little to no content within them. Then you've got your medium content. These are going to be obviously, again, <laughs> middle of the range type books with like a bit more content them so like kids jokes books riddles books maybe some activity books and then you've got your high content books so these are going to be your longer form 30,000 plus word books that you actually sit down to read so finally we've got audiobooks so that one just kind of explains itself to be honest it's the audiobooks that you obviously listen to on a platform like audible and so the reasons we have nonfiction, high content and audiobooks covered so firstly nonfiction. we focus on nonfiction because with fiction books it's a little bit harder to market to them in that um, certain things can be a bit more vague so for example if you you are writing a romance novel and you then want to get you know, that romance novel out in front of people when you type in romance novel to Amazon it's gonna be like a massive massive sea of people looking for romance novels it's just quite a broad general overarching category and it's a little bit harder to niche down within that and get in front of the right audience whereas with nonfiction it's a lot easier to actually pick out a specific target market because people are looking for very specific book topics in the nonfiction space so for example a book about how to um, raise chickens for beginners um, that is a very very specific a very specific thing and that is actually quite an in-demand book topic on Amazon but obviously it's much more specific and something people are typing that exact thing in to actually um, find it on Amazon so therefore it's easier to market to them and then high content so we have high content circled because we personally focus mainly on high content reason being because there's just less competition obviously with low content books they're really easy to put together and because of that a lot of people are doing them whereas with high content take a bit more effort to put together a bit more resources a bit more time so less people are doing it therefore less competition and audiobooks so as Chris said we only recently started doing audiobooks within the last year we've always kind of known about them but we kind of had put them on the back burner and didn't really I think realize the true potential until this year and so yeah we do focus on doing those now as well and I'll just add on to that uh, with high content books and audiobooks they work hand in hand you can't yeah. convert a, a low content or really a medium content book into an audiobook but with high content you can yeah. so you can get another stream of income by doing an audiobook uh, with a high content uh, book so why KDP is such a great business then obviously a disclaimer that we are very biased towards KDP just because it's Love been it. such a great business for us we had tried other online businesses beforehand for example affiliate marketing FBA what else we do Forex trading network marketing, network marketing um, and it didn't work out for us but KDP the, it was the first thing that we did and we kind of picked it up very quickly um, and it's a great business for us and these are the long list of reasons why it's such an awesome awesome business uh, to this day so first of all there is low initial costs this was a big one for us when we started was because we didn't have much capital or we didn't really want to invest much capital in it to begin with mm -hmm. and it has low initial costs because there is basically no inventory at all because because with Amazon, as we said, the print on demand model, um, you're not having to stock any inventory. It's all digital. And therefore, when a customer clicks buy on your product, um, Amazon prints and ships it for you. Also, there's little to no cost for your book production. Um, when we say no cost, you literally can create a book for absolutely nothing, especially the low content books. If you produce it yourself, you create the book cover yourself, etc. Mm -hmm. For the books that we produce, obviously there is a cost to it um, because we're having to get it written. We're not cover designer, yeah. so we get someone to design the cover for us. Uh, but now that we use ChatGPT, our initial costs have absolutely uh, fallen and we can 
produce a book uh, for pretty much less than like three hundred, four hundred dollars now. So, and compared to other businesses, very, very low startup costs. Yeah. Yeah, So, secondly, we've got logistics. So, just generally, I would definitely say the logistics of this are yeah. There's just there's basically less of them to worry about really. So, as we already mentioned, they have their print on demand model. So that's very hands off. You don't have to worry about you know printing a bunch of books and holding them in your home and then shipping them off to customers yourself. And you also have to actually deal with the customer service aspect. So, if for some reason a book is like not printed correctly, then you're not the one who has to deal with that. Amazon is the one that has to deal with that. So it's really great in that sense as well. And also low competition. So this is definitely in comparison to pretty much any other online business out there, which in our opinion, we try them. They're very, very saturated now with KDP and especially Audible. And the competition is so low. And the reason for this is they're not really as well known. You don't really hear many people talking about KDP and especially Audible. There's not the big hype that you get around FBA or that you get around affiliate marketing or around any other businesses and because there's less hype and there's less people that know about it the competition's less the competition's less is easier to rank your book and therefore it's easy to make sales basically yeah definitely um you also have higher profit margins with this so because it's a digital product and you know there's obviously less that goes into actually producing it and it can be sold over and over again your profit margins are going to be higher than like if you're doing drop shipping and you have to um you know pay quite a big chunk of money to produce every like clothing item or whatever yeah. it is that you're making so definitely higher profit margins it's also easy to pick up for beginners um it's a straightforward process and once you learn the process you pretty much just have to rinse and repeat it and as i said we'll get into our seven step process and essentially for every single book that we produce now we just kind of rinse and repeat these seven steps so yeah and it gets um, easier the more you do it gets easier the more you do it as well yeah so it's very easy to kind of pick up in that sense yeah definitely and so it also is um passive income and we have in parentheses eventually here because (laughs) it's not going to be passive immediately Uh, this is something that we don't want to you know miss misconstrue or, or anything like that it does obviously take effort to to start up in the beginning as does any online business but we definitely do believe that this can be super passive eventually once you have your books out and established and the reason we say this is because unlike other business models where you have all those other logistics involved with this once your book is out and established you've gotten your reviews on it and it's doing well all you really have to do is make sure that you're maintaining your ad campaigns every once in a while so um yeah it can really become passive eventually once you've established it yeah so just for context we probably spend around around about 15 to 20 minutes um maybe once or twice a week looking at our ads to maintain them and that's kind of all we do once your book's established and the next one book uh, can bring you in three reliable streams of income these streams are your paperback your ebook and your audiobook. So your paperback and your ebook are on Amazon, and then your audiobook is on Audible. Uh, for us, because we're non-fiction publishers, most of our income comes through our paperback and our audiobook. We don't get as much through our ebook, but it is still a nice income stream which you're producing um, through, you know, through this just one book. Yeah, definitely. And in addition to that, there's no income cap. So all we mean by this really is that there's no limit as to the number of books that Amazon allows you to publish. So you can literally just publish as many books as you want. Obviously, you're wanting them to all be high quality, and the high quality books. Um, the better obviously the more money you'll make but every book is just going to stack on top of the last and finally a very big one for us when we started was there's no social media presence necessary <laughs> in order to make this a success so we didn't want to really build up a big uh, tiktok or youtube or whatever following to try and sell our books we wanted to just kind of keep our heads down and see if it worked or see if it didn't work reason being is because we had tried these other businesses before and failed, <laughs> and, failed. and we didn't really want to tell anyone we we're doing it so we kind of wanted to as i say keep our heads down and see if it worked and then just finally is you can publish under a pen name so you can be completely anonymous doing this which is really good so you can publish under a pen name and you don't need to even show your face on Amazon yeah, um, as an author. Anonymous. Yeah, awesome. Sweet. So now let's just move on to why ACX is such a great business. Obviously, in addition to KDP, but it also has its own perks. So first, we've got low cost. So the only thing you really have to pay for is your narrator to actually produce the audiobook for you. Um, and this is usually only around three hundred dollars max. You're basically paying per finished hour. So um, you can basically choose the range of how much you want to pay, and that's the most we ever really pay for it. Yeah. And secondly, it's no inventory at all. It's a fully digital product. As obviously, it's an audiobook, um, so you don't have to stock any inventory. Yeah. And there is large demand already. So the the market is currently sitting at around 1.7 billion. However, there's even larger demand coming. Um, it's expected that around 2030, it's going to shoot up to around 35 billion. So obviously over time, it's just going to continue to increase. And then next in big 
bold letters is there's low, low competition. The reason being is hardly anyone is talking about it. Online, on TikTok yeah. or YouTube, we can't really find any, well, a few people talking about it, yeah. but not compared to affiliate marketing or FBA, anything like that. And as I said, with low competition, you're gonna get a much easier task of actually getting your books to rank um, and to sell. Yeah, sorry, I just gonna, just to add yeah. on to that really quick as well. So just to give you an idea of how low it actually is, oh, yeah. I know we keep banging on about it, but like, for example, um, you can go look for yourself, but there are certain topics. If you search like investing for beginners on KDP in the book section, you'll get maybe like 10,000 results or something like that. And on ACX, you'll only end up getting maybe like seven, 800. So it's obviously quite mm. a lot less, which is good because you, um, as we already said, it yeah. helps getting to the first page for sales. Yeah. Also, there's no ad spend at all. So with Amazon, um, you're advertising, that's just part and parcel of running that business. But with Audible, there's no advertising platform and therefore no advertising spend. So as long as you can make back the $300 maximum of uh, your narrator, everything after that is pure profit. And to be honest with you, that's pretty easy to do uh, because as I said, the competition is low and therefore it's easy to make money on Sorry, Audible. is the competition lower? <laughs> God, you got me there. <laughs> <laughs> sorry yeah, sorry <laughs> all right and lastly we've got one month payout so the reason we have this as a benefit for acx is because with kdp it takes a couple months for them to actually pay you out so like if you get paid sorry if you make sales in august you don't get paid until september until the end of october whereas with acx they pay out one month after so your august sales will be paid out at the end of september so there's still a little bit of a lag but not nearly as much we're not really too sure why amazon can't pay you out quicker yeah, but hey ho <laughs> they can afford to do it but hey ho so why isn't everyone doing this then? So here are some common myths and misconceptions about Amazon KDP and Audible. So first of all, I don't have enough time. So this is a big one that like we hear quite a lot to be honest with you, mm -hmm. but the way Amazon KDP kind of is, you actually don't need to commit a lot of time to it. Obviously at the start when you're first doing this, we kind of recommend between one to two hours per day to obviously you know do your keyword research, uh, put your book together and do all the other bits around actually, you know, creating a very good book and getting it ranking on Amazon. But after that, it does become fairly handy. So you don't need to commit loads of time in order to actually make this business work. And secondly, we've got, I don't have enough resources. So again, this is something we commonly hear, but really, as we kind of already mentioned, you don't need that much to get started with Amazon KDP. It's got such low startup costs, especially in, to, in comparison to others. And you also do need to look at it kind of as an investment. Obviously the money you're putting into this business is gonna come back to you. Next is I couldn't possibly write a book. And when people first hear self publishing, they're like, God, I gotta be an author or a writer. We're publishers, not authors, and therefore we don't actually need to write the book ourselves. Of course you can do if you want to, and you have good writing skills, but how we do it, we can either get it ghostwritten or now we actually can use ChatGPT in a very, very specific way. And we'll get onto that later on in the presentation. But essentially, no, you don't need to be an author to write your book yourself. Yeah, definitely. The next one is I couldn't publish a book that I didn't write myself. It sounds unethical. This again is something that we hear all the time. People comment this on our TikTok videos, but this also couldn't really be further from the truth. So the purpose of a nonfiction book really is to educate somebody on a topic. And as long as you're doing that in a way that's easy to understand, it's factually correct, and it's just a good overall experience for the reader, then there honestly isn't anything wrong with this because whether you're using a ghostwriter to write your book or you're using AI, it's not unethical as long as the book itself is good. What's unethical is producing a crappy book that is not giving your readers proper um, information or it's giving them, you know, a bad experience in terms of how the book sounds and how it flows. So yeah, there's not really anything wrong with just producing a book as long as it's a good book. That's the most important thing. Next one, there's too much saturation. As we went through, there's not really that much saturation in KDP or in Audible at all. The reason being that on Amazon, there are literally thousands of potential categories and within each category there are you know hundreds of potential yeah. books so there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of book topics you could write about yeah. so almost an endless sea of potential topics um, and also the demand is continuing to grow so both on Amazon and Audible they're both eating market share um, from their competitors so with Amazon I think it's currently 40% of the overall paperback book market and I think it's supposed to increase by 2025 uh, to 60% market share so it's continuing to eat market share from its competitors and also Audible, as we said, at 65%, which is an absolute massive share already. Yeah. Next, we've got, I don't have the tech skills for this. So um, honestly, this is not really a reason to not do this business as well. To be honest, most of the stuff that you actually do need to, you know, do for this business don't necessarily involve like that crazy of tech skills anyways. Like you don't need to be like a computer coder. You don't need to be like a graphic designer or anything like that. You can absolutely do all of this with honestly like the bare minimum tech skills. And who's got bad tech skills here? <laughs> I have bad tech skills. I she say, has, she has good skills and I don't. So and I, I managed to do it, so I'm, you'll be fine. Um, 
And the, the last one here is tried other online businesses before, which didn't work. I mean, we're the biggest examples of uh, trying, trying, trying again before something eventually does work. We tried four businesses before eventually we came across KDP and we've already laid out the reasons why KDP is a very simple uh, beginner friendly method um, to actually learn to. Uh, yeah, uh, I definitely online. think I definitely think Amazon KDP has like a higher percentage of people that mm. do well out of the people doing it when compared to other business models. Yeah, agreed. Okay, so let's go on to step one out of seven. So this is keyword research and we always say this is probably the most important part of the whole process yeah, you definitely. need to know how to do it properly and how to do it well in order to choose your profitable niches that you'll be publishing in yeah, especially if you're doing it to actually make money <laughs> yeah exactly exactly uh, so first of all a niche is simply a main overarching theme or classification within an industry so for amazon a niche is the same as a category and a sub niche is the same as a subcategory and on amazon there are 36 main niches that you can publish in so here's some examples from Amazon then. Uh, these are some niches or categories um, on Amazon. So your business and money, that's quite a big one. So arts and photography, romance, health, fitness and darting, mystery, thriller and suspense, and so on and so on. Um, so in terms of niches that we would publish in, we only publish non-fiction books and therefore there's only about, I think 15 or 16 categories yeah. that we would actually publish in. And for example, one of them is business and money. Another one is crafts, hobbies and home. So here's how it will look on Amazon. So when you click onto the books section, Section on Amazon, you'll basically be presented with the 36 categories down the side here. These are your main overarching niches. And then we go into the sub niches. So we've actually gone into the business and money uh, niche here. This is the overarching main category. It can then be broken down into further sub niches or subcategories. These are just three of them. So you've got investing, personal finance, real estate, and I think there's about 10 or 12 uh, sub niches. And then we can go down even further, we go into the investing sub sub niche. And then this gets broken down into your uh, different sub sub niches down here. So for example, you have analysts and strategy, bonds, commodities, etc. And what we said down the bottom here you shouldn't just publish a book about a main niche this would just be too broad and there'll be too much competition and in a lot of cases it wouldn't really make sense i mean yes you could publish a book about business and money but there will literally be thousands upon thousands of books about business and money and your book unfortunately would get lost in the seat of other books uh, to do with business and money that's why it's a much more targeted approach we take actually trying to target a very very specific topic that means the competition is much less so this is just a diagram kind of just to show you a bit more um, about kind of the niches and sub niches etc so at the top of the pyramid here we have the overarching niche Again, we've chosen a business and money niche. We can then break it down to investing. This is your layer of sub niches. Um, and here are the other sub niches within this business and money niche. We can then break it down even further into your sub sub niches. And we chose stocks here, but there's also bonds, derivatives, options, etc. And then within stocks, which is a sub sub niche, we can then look for particular book topics to actually publish a book about. So for example, in the stocks sub sub niche, uh, books, for example, stock market investing, stock investing for teens, stock day trading, psychology of trading stocks, etc. And it's at this level down here, which is where you're gonna find the book topics which have the lowest amount of competition and therefore the easiest to start as a beginner publisher to actually make some serious money from this. So just to really hit it home, keywords are gonna be those searchable terms that customers are typing into Amazon when they're looking for a very specific topic. So as we said in the last slide, you're gonna be looking for things like real estate investing, square foot gardening, knitting for beginners. So it's gonna be that term that customers are literally typing into the search bar. That's kind of where you wanna to get to in terms of how specific because that's where you're gonna get those less competition keywords as opposed to in you know the general niches or sub niches. All right, so how do we actually find book topics? The first thing you're probably gonna wanna do is actually just sit down and brainstorm. So get a pen and paper if you need to, or open up a Google Doc and just start jotting down ideas of something that you might already be interested in, you know, any sort of keywords that might fall into that niche. So for example, if you are into like, DIY home type stuff. You could do stuff like candle making, soap making off the top of my head, maybe something like knitting or just jot down sort of general ideas. Once you've done some brainstorming, you're then gonna head over to Amazon and start clicking through the best sellers list. So we'll show you how to do this in a second a bit more thoroughly, but basically you're just gonna be browsing and just looking for book topic ideas that are already selling. And you're gonna need a few different things um, to look at it. The one that you definitely need is DS Amazon Quick View. So that's just a free Google Chrome extension. You can literally just Google it and then add it to Chrome. Um, but the other ones 
that we do sort of recommend and that we like using are either Bookbeam, Katie Spy, or Publisher Rocket. Um, you don't necessarily have to have all three. We personally do just because we're a bit publishing crazy, I guess. Um, but at least DS Amazon Quick View, just so that you can actually see the best sellers rank um, a bit more efficiently. So you can actually just click into the page, as we'll show you in a minute, to, to scroll down and basically look at these. So you don't actually need a tool to be able to see the best sellers rank. It just makes it a lot more efficient. But basically, the best sellers rank is just the rank in the overall books category on Amazon. So if you're ranking number one in the books category, then that means you're the number one best selling book on Amazon. Or for example, if you're um, ranking like 10,000, then you're the 10,000th best selling book. However, it's also important to note, um, as you can see in this picture here, they have all these other categories that your book obviously might be ranking in. And those you don't really want to pay attention to those you just want to be paying attention in terms of profitability to the actual books category. So you can just kind of ignore the rest of them. Okay, so how do we actually determine profitability? The main things we're going to be looking at are high demand and low competition. So there are a few different ways that you can sort of look into high demand. The main way that we personally look into it is by making sure that when we're typing a keyword into the search bar and all that list of books pops up, you want to make sure that there are multiple books that have less than 100,000 BSR. So the reason we choose 100,000 is because that means there's roughly one or two sales per day for that book. And also our goal is to obviously end up publishing a book that does a lot better than 100,000, but that's just kind of our mark for showing that there is demand for that topic. Another thing you can do is look up in the auto suggestions. So when you're starting to type a keyword in, usually Amazon will auto suggest a list of other things based on what you've typed in. And if the keyword that you're looking into pops up as an auto suggestion, that also does show demand because obviously this means that enough other people are searching for it that Amazon felt the need to put it in their auto suggestions. So secondly, we look at competition. So basically the more books that you have on that page with less reviews, the better. And the reason we say this is because obviously reviews are super important and you need to be able to get a lot of reviews to get on the first page. So the more books that there are on the first page that have little reviews, the easier it will be for you to catch up to those books and also get yourself on the first page. Because obviously that just means that you will need to get less reviews to get there as well. And just to add on to that as well. So one of the primary ways that Amazon actually ranks your book, it kind of determines which books are shown in the first page is the number and the quality of reviews. So the more good quality of reviews that you have, the easier it's gonna to be to actually get on that first page. Awesome, right, so let's go over to Amazon now and just kind of take you through uh, how we look for books. Okay, so over in Amazon now, so what we're gonna do first of all is take you through a strategy, actually how to find potential books to write about. And we've also got an example to run through that profitability check, which we do for all our books. So first of all, in the book section, we're then gonna to go to bestsellers and more. We're gonna to go to print bestsellers because this is where we make uh, the most of our money as non-fiction publishers. So that's where you want to do your research. So here are the categories on the side here. And what we always do says it's a bit more optimal to choose uh, categories to do your research in that you're actually passionate about, that you have an interest in. It just makes it a little bit easier uh, to do the whole process of publishing a book if you're actually interested in that particular topic. Sorry, just to add on to that, you don't necessarily have to do something that you obviously like if you can't for some reason find anything, but generally you will be able to find something. So we do recommend doing that because like Chris said, it does make it easier. But if you absolutely can't find anything that you are interested, then it is okay to branch out and look into other things, but just, yeah, try to stick something you're interested in if you can. Okay, so let's go into a category then that we're both interested in. So let's click on health, fitness and dieting. Um, and then these are the different sub niches down here. And this is the main overarching niche. And so just to point out down here, this is uh, the DS Amazon Quick View plugin. So this is telling us the BSR ranking and of all the books on Amazon. So for example, uh, this book here, Atomic Habits, is eight in uh, Audible. So that's actually, um, so there's actually a difference here between Audible books and in books. And also there's a Kindle one as well. So just watch out for if it says in books or in Audible books or in Kindle store. Um, so this is number eight in all of Audible. This is number 11, all of Audible, 17, etc. cetera. Um, so what you're looking for is books under 100,000, which is this number here. Right, so if we go into uh, another niche. Let's go into, what should we go into? Alternative medicine. So you can go down one layer again into these sub sub niches, or you can just stick to doing your research in, in this niche here. So we'll just stick with this one for now. So all we're gonna be doing is scrolling down this bestsellers list. The reason we're doing this is because we know these books are selling and therefore there's demand about these particular topics. So we could theoretically write a book about them. Okay, so we're gonna go down this list of alternative medicine and look for uh, what the books are actually about. So just to say that sometimes or quite often the title of the book is not actually what the book is about so you need to kind of decipher uh, the actual book topic um, beyond just the title sometimes the title will tell you exactly what the book is about for example if the book says raising chickens for beginners that is the keyword and that is what you note down 
But for example, if it's like fast like a girl, um, I guess that might be fasting for girls actually. Um, but for, <laughs> for example, the body keeps the score. That is not a keyword because um, your customers are not typing in the body keeps the score unless they are looking for that particular book. Um, but if that is the case, then we don't want to just copy that same book. We want to get that um, actual book subject. So what we can do, if we don't know what the actual book is about, we can go into the books page and then try and decipher um, what it is about. Okay, so healing trauma. So that could be your keyword. Um, and just to show you actually where you can find the BSR ranking if you don't have DSM Amazon Quick View. So you just scroll down and then you look at product details and it tells you number 48 in um, Audible Books and Originals. If you wanted to find the paperback BSR, you then have to click into the paperback version um, and then scroll down. Okay, so that's the first one. So we jot that down. This one, yeah, a woman's guide to fasting. So um, fasting for women, that could be your keyword. I wouldn't put fast like a girl because I wouldn't necessarily think that um, women or girls. That's not like that's not how you would think to type it into. The no, search bar. exactly, exactly. Um, the also, you tend to find more specific keywords, obviously, as you go further into these sub sub niches. So sometimes, like I, I do find that the further up in the categories you are, the more sort of obscure yeah. titles you'll tend to find. So what's that third one? So meditations for. So that's a meditation book. Meditations for habits. Yeah, something. meditations for habits, yeah. Crystals for beginners, that's definitely a yeah. keyword. Uh, this one here, the Wim Hof method, um, you wouldn't put that down because... Um, it's I'm probably copyrighted. Pretty sure it's copyrighted yeah. from Wim Hof himself. So You're allowed to, that's actually, yeah, you can do like a guidebook about this method, but you're not allowed to just that's call your book the same. That's, huh? a good point. that's a good point, yeah. Yeah, you're not allowed to just call your book the same book, obviously, because it's not your... Not your idea. Yeah. So essentially, that's kind of what you do. So you're going to be going into these sub niches, sub sub niches, and then just noting down a long list. Hopefully, you're going to get at least 20, maybe 30, 40 uh, potential topics. Um, for each book, it's about a particular topic. So if you don't know what it is just from the title, go into it and then decipher it. Um, and then, yeah, that's kind of what the process you'd go through. Stick yeah, to the so topics, six of those categories that you enjoy or are interested in. Yeah, so that is also just kind of the top level thing. So this is not, just to clarify, this is not necessarily where you're going to be looking for under 100,000. So this is yeah. just where you're collecting a list of topics. So like, again, medicinal herbs or whatever the whatever the topics that you found, you're going to list them out. And then your next step is going to actually be to search them in the search bar up here. And then once you type that in, so for example, we've got this here. Um, we've typed in homesteading for beginners. So first of all, um, if you... If you start typing in homesteading, um, you can see all the different things that pop up as an auto suggestion. So as we mentioned, that kind of shows that there's demand. So for the example, we had just done homesteading for beginners. Um, but this is where you're then going to take that list and you're going to test each individual keyword for its profitability using the guidance that we basically said in the last couple slides. Yes, yeah, so once you've done it, then that's when we're going to be running our profitability checks. So this is a really, really important step. You can't just note down a list of 40 topics and then just choose one you know you need to actually have evidence behind it that it has high demand and it has low competition yeah so this step is obviously tedious because you're having to go through each keyword and check but that's how you're going to make the money because if you don't do that you're probably not going to make on any money if you're just choosing random topics so we have the slow version and the fast version to go through so the slow version is essentially going manually going through all the topics looking at the bsr and then looking at the number of views on the first page um, if you have kd spy it's a bit of a shortcut way of doing it so it's a google chrome extension i think it costs 60 dollars to actually um have access to it so once you've installed it on google chrome um it will then basically pull all the data that we need from the uh, books page and it'll tell you the sales rank and the number of reviews. So what we're looking for, we're looking for multiple books which have under 100,000 BSR. So this is the BSR here, the sales rank. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, yeah, so five, that is multiple. So that tells us there is high demand. And then we look at the reviews. So we're looking for uh, lots of books, multiple books with a low number of reviews. We tend to classify this between 300 to 400 reviews. Um, this is a realistic number that we could actually catch and then surpass if we have a good strategy in place to accumulate reviews on our books. So we have one down here, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
11. So there's 11 books there on the first page, which have less than 300, 400 reviews, and therefore there is low competition. And just finally, to point out here on Katie Spike does say, have a popularity, potential, and competition. We just stick to what works for us, which is the reviews and the sales rank. Yeah, sorry, just to quickly add on. So ideally you want the books that are ranking under 100,000 to be the ones that are also low on reviews, because this means that those books that are doing well didn't need that many reviews to get to that point. So that's kind of what we're looking for. And again, that kind of helps you to know that it'll be a lot easier to get your book ranking on the first page with a lower number of reviews. Awesome, so that's our keyword research process. Um, so once you've chosen your book topic and you've done the research, you can then go on to step number two, which is creating your outline for your book. Okay, so step number two is outline curation. So essentially with your outline, it is a list of chapters and resources to help you produce your book. So in order to actually create an outline, you need to do your own research. Yes, you might like and enjoy your subject that you've chosen, but you still need to read up on it, really make yourself accustomed to it and have good knowledge in it basically. So for us, whenever we're going to a new topic, a new subject, we would first of all go to Google and actually have a read about it through articles in Google or through any books or learning off YouTube to kind of have a basis kind of foundational understanding of our new topic that we're venturing into. Also, you can research your competitors. So what we've done in the past is we've actually ordered our uh, competitors Kindle version of their book. Have a read of it. This way, you first of all get included up about what you know you can include in your book, but also you can kind of try and pick holes in your uh, competitors' books to see what they did well and see what they didn't do so well to see where you can improve. And that kind of leads on to the next one as well. So research competitors' reviews. So this is really really key, and it's kind of one of the biggest um, hacks that we've learned over the years of doing this. Is actually going onto Amazon and choosing your like top three or top four competitors, and then in each of your competitors' books, scrolling down to their review section. And this way you can read the reviews of your competitors. This is so so valuable. Yeah. because you're learning first of all what went well so the four and five star written reviews will tell you what customers liked about that book and therefore you're not going to copy what they put in but you're going to obviously produce similar hopefully better content as well and then the three two and one star reviews are really what's going to be valuable for you because this is how you can improve your book in comparison to your competitors. You can take what the customers didn't like about your competitors and then improve your book um, by working on those specific points. And next we have ChatGPT. Obviously everyone's heard of this. You can now use it to produce really, really good robust outlines for a book. Um, we've actually created a video on exactly how to use ChatGPT um, to actually create an outline and also create your full length manuscript using it. So uh, we'll leave that link to that video uh, below in the description of this video. So go and check that out if you want to um, have a look at that. Um, but what we do say with uh, outline creation using ChatGPT, don't just use what it gives you. It's a great starting point for sure, but it's definitely not like, it's, it's not gonna give you the exact outline that you should use initially. Sometimes it'll pull things in that are, don't necessarily make sense for the book you're trying to create or some Sometimes it'll leave certain topics out that maybe should be included. So it's good to use it as sort of a base um, a base outline, but then that is where your own research sort of comes in and you want to make sure that what it's provided is actually sufficient um, and also just not including anything that, like like I said, doesn't make sense or um, um, isn't actually necessary for the book to do well. Yeah, that's why using a combination of ChatGPT and your own research, that's what we personally do, is your best option for um, producing a really good outline. Yeah. And then just finally, it needs to be super detailed and very thorough. The the more detail you can provide in your outline, the better your book's gonna be basically. So don't rush this phase of your book creation because it is a really, really important one. Sorry, one other thing that actually helps as well when you're researching your competitors is you can use the look inside feature for mm. most eBooks as well. So basically what you can do is click look inside and that will just show you like the, the list of chapters and topics basically. So again, just to reiterate, you should never be copying any of these books. The whole idea here is that you're just looking into these books and seeing what types of topics they're including in their books. You know, what topics did well, what topics didn't do so well. Um, yeah, so just make sure you're um, taking advantage of that feature as well. Awesome. So step three is on to book creation. All right, sweet. So once you've got your book topic and you've done your outline, this is when you can actually go into producing the book. So for the actual book, you're going to need a few things. You're going to obviously need the manuscript, which is the content that you're going to produce. So the actual chapters and the actual content of the book. And then you're going to need a title and a subtitle. And you're also going to need to choose an author name. Okay, so the first place you can get your manuscript, your actual content of your book written is by hiring a ghost writer. So this is a professional writer who you pay to write the content of your book. So there's three places we recommend or that we personally had experience with, and that is the Urban Writers, 
and hot ghostwriters. So these are actual ghostwriting companies. They have a vetting process to um, vet their ghostwriters. So you know you're gonna get high quality work from them. And then finally is Upwork. So this is a freelance website where you can hire ghostwriters. A word of caution here, make sure you know how to properly vet these writers before you actually take them on board. Um, because we've had an incident in the past where we hired a ghostwriter from Upwork, we didn't do a proper vetting process and it turned out to be an absolute nightmare. So uh, that's just a word of caution before you go down the Upwork route. All right, so the second way you can go about actually getting your manuscript done is obviously you can write it yourself. However, you really should only do this if you have very good writing skills. So this is something that we can't stress enough. If you, and just be honest with yourself, like if you know you don't have good writing skills, you probably shouldn't tr be trying to write an entire book by yourself. So um, yeah, as it says here, do it if you have very good writing skills, if you have knowledge of a subject, because that obviously will just help in terms of the writing flow and your creative ability. Um, make sure you have a good engaging writing style. And finally, just make sure that you know you have the ability to create good flow between your sections, your paragraphs, your chapters, and just the book as a whole. So again, you can do it yourself, but you should definitely be someone who has very good writing skills if that is the case. And the actual content of your book is so, so, so important for your book to have longevity. Because things like your book cover, your description on Amazon, your ads, your A plus content, your overall listing, are gonna be the things which actually sell your book in the short term, but it's the actual content of your book that your customers actually care about. And if it's just naff or it's not written in a nice way or good way, then unfortunately you're gonna get bad reviews and then bad reviews are gonna to lead to basically your sales tanking. So uh, the actual content needs to be written in a very good um, way that's received well by, by your customers. And then finally, we have ChatGPT as our final way to actually write our books. And yes, you can use it to produce really high quality manuscripts, but it has to be done in a specific specific way. You've got to make sure it sounds human-like. Um, and the most important thing about ChatGPT is not just taking what it gives you and publishing it as is, because that's only going to lead to it sounding like it's being written by AI and your customers will easily be able to pick up on this and it's probably going to land you with a lot of bad reviews. So what you're going to do is you're going to take what it gives you and run it through AI SEO, or this is what we personally do, or a similar software. And all AI SEO is, it's a paraphrasing tool. So it will kind of change what the uh, ChatGPT has given you and make it sound a bit more human-like. We then take what that has given us and then we're adding our own human sentiment to it. We're changing it, making it more human-like um, yeah. and kind of doing that as we go, basically. I would arguably say that's actually probably the more important part than mm. running it through a pair. I mean, obviously you should do both steps, but I think personally that adding your actual own personal human touch is um, more important than um, whatever any other software can sort of paraphrase for you. Because at the end of the day, those are still all AI yeah. and you're the human, so yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then you're checking it for plagiarism and this is a really, really, really important step because Amazon, if one thing Amazon doesn't like is plagiarizing or copyright. So mm -hmm. um, you want to run it through Scribber, which is a plagiarism checker and making sure you have a plagiarism check of ideally below uh, uh, 15, 20%, something like that. You're not gonna be able to get to 0%, but roughly under 20%. And one thing to know about using ChatGPT to write your book is it will take time. You can't do it in one day as some people are professing to do on uh, on YouTube. Because if you do it that quickly, unfortunately it's gonna be a very, very uh, poor quality book that you haven't really changed anything to it. So it does take time and you want to commit a good amount of time to actually um, turning it into a very good book. You know, that's kind of the trade-off as well in terms of ChatGPT versus getting a ghostwriter for anyone wondering. Both are honestly options that are just as good as each other. It's just that obviously with a ghostwriter, you're paying someone and you're fully hands-off basically. So they're doing all the hard work. Whereas with ChatGPT, it's a little bit more effort obviously on your end, but you can get it done quicker and for cheaper obviously. Oh, actually one other thing as well with ChatGPT, make sure you're getting the paid for version. That's like our one, oh, yeah. it's, it is $20 a month, but you can cancel it whenever. And honestly, the material that you can get back from ChatGPT Plus, which is the most recent version, which is like 4. Point whatever or 4.0 maybe, it's just a lot better in terms of language capability and the information that it gives out as opposed to the free version. So definitely get the paid for version. Agreed. All right, so on this page, we've got a quality over speed. So as we kind of already mentioned, um, your book cover, your description, your ads and everything are what are going to be the thing that get your customer to buy in the short term and for you to get those initial sales. But if your content of your book is bad quality, you're gonna end up getting bad reviews and it's not gonna end up doing well. So it really is the quality of your book's content that's going to help it sell in the long term. So. Again, regardless of how you get it done, whether you get it done by a ghostwriter, whether you do it, or whether you use ChatGPT, you have to make sure it's high quality.
and just quickly medium and low content books. So our main focus and where we make most of our money is through high content publishing. These are your longer form books, but there is medium and low content books as well. And um, so obviously in this video, we don't have time to go in exactly how to create uh, medium and low content books, but two places that are particularly good for this are BookBolt, great for low content books. It has, they have lots of uh, low content uh, templates on there and also medium content as well because their pro version has a puzzle creator software that you can use to create um, activity books and medium, medium content books. And Canva is a great option for medium and low content books as well. And just finally, for coloring books to use stock images, you can use iStock, Adobe Stock, or Shutterstock. Sweet, so the next thing that you're going to need for the actual content of your book is going to be your book title. So your book title has two main things. First and foremost is SEO. Um, you obviously wanna make sure that your book is showing up in the right places. So you have to have all of the relevant keywords in your title in order to be able to tell Amazon what your book is about and show up in front of the right people. So if your book is about raising chickens for beginners, you have to have that in your main title. And then you can also include other keywords in your subtitle as well if they're relevant to your book. And secondly, you just want to appeal to your ideal customer, obviously. So to be honest, your main keyword is already going to be in the main title anyways, but you just want to make sure that this is actually calling out your direct target audience. So for example, again, Raising Chicken for Beginners is really ap appealing to that direct target audience because um, if somebody is scrolling through the books about that book topic and it's not clear what your book is about, it's not going to speak to them. They're not going to, they're not even going to, you know, give it a second chance and click into it if they don't know what it's about. Because if you think about it, you got a fraction of a second to to capture your customer's attention. Um, you have two ways of doing this. Obviously the book cover, the main image, mm. and the title. So that's why um, the customer needs to know exactly what the book is about when they're scrolling. Right, so how do we go about creating a book title then for Amazon? So our first port call is looking at our competitors' titles, but obviously we want to be different from them. We don't want to have the same title. And ideally we want to be better than our competitors. So a good place to start off this is actually using ChatGPT. And this is something we've been using recently, asking ChatGPT to give us 10 title suggestions suggestions for a book about, let's use your example of um, raising chickens for beginners. It will give you 10 different sounding book titles and then you can obviously take these if they're good enough, but then you can change and amend it to make it more to your sounding. Um, and most importantly, as we again we put down here, is including your main keyword. Let's say that's raising chickens for beginners or just raising chickens in your main title, not to have it in your subtitle or not to have it anywhere at all. Make sure it's in your main title. Okay, so we have an example title down here. Um, so the actual book topic is sustainable greenhouse gardening and therefore we have that in our main title. And then here is an example of a subtitle. So a comprehensive guide to building and managing your greenhouse from planning and construction to maintenance and beyond. So the reason this is a good subtitle is because it's telling your reader a bit more about what the book actually has to offer them. But also very importantly, it's included other keywords uh, to do with your main topic. So for example, you might've done some research um, and a keyword might have been managing your greenhouse or um, construction uh, construction of a greenhouse or um, greenhouse maintenance. These keywords, obviously, they're not the main ones that you're ranking for, but a customer might be typing in managing your greenhouse and then um, would buy your book, um, but they wouldn't be able to find that if you just had sustainable greenhouse gardening and that was your title um, alone. All right, so next we've got the author name. So you can use a pen name if you are someone who doesn't necessarily want to use your real name or you, you know, want to remain completely anonymous, or you can use your real name if you're comfortable with that, or maybe you have a topic that you are already like an authority in and you, you know, you feel comfortable with having your name out there. But this really is just kind of personal preference, to be honest. There's no right or wrong answer to this. It's just whether or not you want your name out there or not. So also the benefit of using a pen name, depending on the niche, is whether or not your personal brand like necessarily fits with that. That niche. So for example, if you are doing a topic about like strength training for women, um, sometimes it might be more beneficial to use a female pen name if you're actually a male or vice versa, just because sometimes the audience will be more receptive to that. Not necessarily that it's right or wrong, but just psychologically, women tend to gravitate towards women for, for topics like that and vice versa. So um, it can be beneficial to use a pen name in that sort of case. But yeah, again, it's kind of personal preference. So step four is editing and formatting them. Firstly, and this has to be done, you can't just get it back from your ghostwriter and then just you know, publish it as is. You want to read it through thoroughly. So you want to be checking for any grammar. This is really important. If your customers pick up any grammar mistakes, they will call you out for it. We've had it in the past. Checking for flow and then repetitiveness. This is especially important if you use ChatGPT, um, changing any repetitive words that it uses or any uh, uh, sentence structure we normally find. And also it kind of goes with that saying, but you want to check 
for the overall quality um, of the book itself. And as you're reading through, you want to alter the content as you go to obviously improve it uh, where possible. Ideally, you want to read through at least two or three times. Reading once through probably won't be enough. And with this part, you can actually outsource this. And we do recommend to outsource this part if your English skills are not very good or you perceive your English skills to not be very good um, or you're not a native English speaker. The reason being your market, especially for English books, will, are gonna be um, the US, you know, UK, Canada, Australia, and they are fluent English speakers and therefore they want their books to you know, read very well and not have any mistakes or grammar mistakes or uh, just poor quality. Yeah, so. it'll be obvious if it's not. Um if it's not good enough quality basically and people will call you up for it. Yeah, definitely. Next, you want to choose your trim size. So this can differ based on your niche. For example, uh, the books that we normally publish, which are high content books, uh, we found to be best for either five inches by eight inches or six inches by nine inches. Um, but for medium content books, especially like these activity books, you're actually uh, gonna be writing in, um, 8.5 by 11 inches um, is more of an appropriate size because you're not gonna be doing an activity book uh, within a six by nine small book. And then you want to format using a formatting software. So we personally use Vellum, but you can use another software called Atticus. Um, but this also can be outsourced if you want it to be. So for example, on Fiverr, there are many people offering formatting services um, to make your book look presentable, basically. Yeah, and people really can tell the difference between something that's actually been you know, professionally formatted mm. or formatted using professional software as opposed to like putting it together in a Word doc. It looks totally different um, and it's just a lot more aesthetically pleasing. All right, sweet. So the next step is going to be getting your book cover created. So this is a super, super, super important step. We say they're all important, but this one is also very important. So essentially, the better your book cover, the more sales you're going to make. And this is just because obviously, if you have a crappy book cover, people are not going to want to buy it. Like they're not going to click into it. They're going to scroll right past it. And it's just it's not going to make a difference to them that your book even exists. So you want it to be really, really, um, you know, high quality and really stand out. So we've got a couple different options that we'll just quickly go through. We've got your budget option as well as your non budget option. And you can really tell when a book cover is being made um, by someone with not very good design skills, can't you? Yeah. Um, and if it's bad, it's people, as you said, people are just going to scroll past it in your book. Yeah. You might have the best book in the world the actual content might be the best uh, but if you can't get people to even click into your book's page it's, it's not going to sell so first of all the do-it-yourself option so if and only if you have good design skills you should attempt to creating your own book cover um, and if you're going to go down this route you want to understand your niche fully and know how to stand out and look professional and look eye-catching within your particular niche so you need to do your own research first of all with the niche you're going into and figure out how you can stand out from the competition so there are a lot of places you can create your book cover a canvas is a great example of one um, and just down the bottom here we said you can use AI so this has obviously been a big thing recently there's a AI uh, image creation kind of software called Midjourney um, it probably can't create an actual book cover for you but what it can do is create some really amazing images um, to actually use on your book cover and a couple of our students recently have actually used Midjourney to create their main image for their book cover um, and it looks pretty some of the things people have come up with are really impressive honestly it's a really really great tool again yeah. but most importantly you need to have good design skills in order to attempt to do it yourself. All right, so if you are not planning on doing it yourself, then uh, the first place that we like to go to, which is our budget option, is Fiverr. So with Fiverr, it's just a freelance website, so you can basically go on and scroll through all the different um, artists that are on there. And typically, you can get a book cover created for $15 to $20. And some, honestly, you can you can pay a lot more for but I'd just be careful paying that much because when you're usually paying that much for one artist, you kind of put in all your eggs in one basket. So you just want to be careful with that. Um, but usually what we like to do is get one of the covers that are a bit cheaper, so like 15 to $20. And obviously you're just looking for d design artists who have really good, great quality portfolio. And then you're going to get a few different covers made from them. That way you have one to choose from. And if you're interested, we will leave these three links below. So these are three artists that we have gone back to continuously just because we like their design so much. So we'll link them down below for you um, in case you wanted to have look at those so and finally is our non-budget option and for this we use 99 designs so it is a little bit more expensive but you're going to get lots of high quality designs and also more to choose from so essentially what it is you can launch a competition for many cover designers to design your particular cover and their incentive is the prize pot. Um, so there's a different packages. So we always use the bronze package. So that's $150. I think it goes up to maybe $600 or $700 for the platinum package. But for us, uh, bronze has always been good enough. Essentially, the winner of the competition who you get to choose wins the prize. So that's their incentive. And you can probably expect between maybe 40 to 70 um, individual cover designs. So it gives you a really large option of cover designs to choose from. Obviously, then you can choose your favorite. Yeah, so you're obviously paying a lot more than what you would pay for like a single cover 
cover on Fiverr, but obviously with this, you're getting so many more covers. So um, it's definitely worth it because you're also getting a lot of different sort of concepts for your covers as well, as opposed to going to one person and just getting one concept. So step number six is your book launch. All right, so with your launch strategy, we usually like to break it up into a pre-launch phase, a launch phase, and then a post-launch phase. So in your pre-launch, you obviously can't just upload it and hope that your book is gonna sell. That will simply never work. It doesn't matter how good your book is. If you just upload it to Amazon and don't do anything to actually get it off the ground, it's not gonna work well. So pre-launch basically consists of getting with a ton of early readers for your book. So we say around 100 minimum because obviously everybody that you do get to read your book early is not necessarily going to leave a review. The more people you can gather to actually read your book early the more reviews you're going to get when it actually launches and yeah there are obviously a lot of different ways that you can do this one of the main ways is by just you know obviously reaching out to people so you can go into like facebook groups or into like reddit threads about whatever the topic of your book is and you're basically going to be reaching out to people and asking if they um can read your book early basically and give you feedback now it's important to say that you absolutely can't demand reviews from anyone this is like definitely not allowed with amazon's t's and c's and also people just obviously won't warm to you very well if you're just going to them and just saying hey give me a review um, so you're obviously going to kind of to want to be reaching out to people in a nice, like warm, friendly way. Um, just letting them know you're having a book coming out on XYZ, whatever your topic is, and ask if they would like a copy um, in preparation for your launch and whether they'd be willing to give you feedback later down the line, basically. And also just to add, um, it's not just random people or random Facebook groups. You're going into specific Facebook groups yeah. about your target niche. So if you're doing a book on uh, gardening, you need to go into lots of gardening Facebook groups, not into uh, random Facebook groups. Yeah, that's a very good point. Also, that leads me into this next point is also if you are keen enough you also can create a Facebook group yeah. for yourself um, and obviously it takes a little bit of effort to grow that group initially but once you have a group you kind of have free reign over that group so you can market all of your books to those people and obviously they will kind of come into the group knowing that you're an author for whatever whatever that niche is so they'll be more receptive to you know helping you out and getting your book early and then also leaving your review later down the line so that is kind of the yeah most important part for pre-launch is getting those early readers and then you also will need to get a book description so you can use chat GPT for this honestly now it's a really great tool to use in terms of just having it give you ideas and then again the most important part is always going to be adding human sentiment but the book description is also another great selling point for your book it's it's literally like basically a built-in marketing um, page for your book so you want to make sure that you're really utilizing it and really including information about the book that's going to make the reader want to buy it basically so then you have your actual launch of your book uh, so this is the exciting part actually where you'd be launching your book and hopefully quite soon making some money on it um, so there's a kind of a five step process that we go through to actually launch your book. So first of all, you want to upload it to Amazon KDP. Obviously, as this is already quite a long video, we're not gonna take you through exactly the step by step um, of doing that, but go to Amazon KDP and then just follow the instructions. Uh, click on the big yellow button, which says plus create, um, and then you can you know, follow the steps and upload your book fairly simply. You want to do a paperback and an ebook version. As I said already in this video, we make around about between 80, maybe 90% of our sales through our paperback, but you will also make sales through your ebook, so it is worth uploading that as well. Um, you then want to ask your early readers to review your book as soon as possible. So this is really important. So you've given your ebook out or your PDF to your early readers prior to your launch. When you're actually launching, you can ask these early readers to review your book. The quicker they do it, the better, because Amazon is looking at how many reviews you're getting early on after it's released. It's kind of telling Amazon that you've got a good book and therefore it's gonna rank it higher, um, the more good and the more uh, positive reviews you have. Um, and also it can help with sales as well because reviews act as social proofs. The more you have them, the more other customers are gonna think highly of your book and the more sales you're gonna make. And it's kind of like a good vicious circle, so the more reviews you get, the more sales you get, the higher you rank, etc., etc. Number four is back-end keywords. So when you're actually uploading a book Book to Amazon, there is a, a part of the upload process where they ask you to uh, put in back end keywords. Um, and these are essentially additional keywords that you haven't been able to fit into your title or subtitle, but are related to your book. And it basically just provides more metadata to Amazon uh, to kind of tell Amazon what your book um, is about. So from our example earlier of sustainable greenhouse gardening, um, some additional keywords that we could use to kind of tell Amazon what else our book is about is maybe like growing vegetables or uh, growing fruit or gardening for beginners or you know anything else you can think of, which is kind of related to that book, which you haven't been able to include in your title. Sorry, title. just really quickly to add on to that as well. You shouldn't necessarily, you don't need to be redundant with your keywords. So you don't need to then, so if mm. your book is about greenhouse gardening, you don't need to necessarily then put that again in your backend keywords. And I think actually, Amazon don't like when you do this so it really should only be keywords that you couldn't fit into your main title and, and subtitle and also they always do have to re be relevant
relevant. So you can't just like put random keywords in yeah. just because you want it to show up for somewhere if it doesn't actually have to do with what your book is about. Yeah, really good point. And then uh, also A plus content. So A plus content is essentially um, extra graphics and images you can put on your book's page itself. So when you go onto a book's page and you scroll about halfway down, there's a place on the page which says um, from the publisher and you can put extra graphics in here and it's kind of like an extra selling point um, to your customers to tell them a bit more what your book's about, to be more visually appealing. Uh, yeah, it really makes your book's page just look overall more professional, I would say, and polished as well. Yeah, agreed. So number five is pricing then. So this is a bit of an art and a science. Um, what you want to be doing is you want to be looking at your competitors his books seeing where they're pricing their book at you don't want to be at or above you want to be slightly below their book because obviously they have the ranking already they have probably have more reviews than you um, and their books are more optimized than yours is because yours is just being released and therefore you need to have an edge and your edge over your competitors is that is that reduced price so let's just say your competitors are roughly selling their book for let's say 14.99 to 16.99 you could start at 12.99 to get those few initial sales starting to come in before after a month of being out you can slow start to increase your book's price once you have sales and once you have reviews in your book and also you don't want to increase it from let's say 12.99 bang up to 16.99 in one go you want to increase it slowly and incrementally to kind of see how it affects your sales yeah. so what we tend to advise is maybe like one dollar every couple of weeks seeing how it affects your sales and if your sales are maintained then you can increase it again and so on all right, so finally, we've got the post-launch phase. So at this point, your book is out, it's listed on Amazon, and the most important thing that you can do in your post-launch phase is going to be continue to grind for those reviews. So as we said multiple times already, reviews are super important. If you don't have any reviews, your book's not gonna do well, and you genuinely will do better. It's almost like a, li a linear correlation that the more reviews you have, the better your book is gonna do. So keep getting reviews in those Facebook groups that you've already been in, or maybe the people you've continued to reach out for, just keep asking them for reviews, obviously nicely, um, don't pester to them too much but you just basically want to keep um, gathering those ones and getting new ones and then you can also look into other sources like Pubby and BookBite so both of these are book review services basically where it's a big exchange um, fully within Amazon's guidelines and everything but basically it's just you and a bunch of other like self publishers who are kind of um, in a review circle reviewing each other's books but they're a really great source to get reviews after your book has been published but you can't actually use them until you have gone live because you do need your book's link in order to then um, get listed on the website so both are really great. Puppy's a bit more established, book, book Bite is a bit newer, but definitely both places to go for reviews. So step seven is audiobook conversion then. So this is a really, really important step because it's creating another source of income, another stream of income on top of your book that's already being created. So once it's approved on KDP, you can then claim on ACX. So ACX is Audible's equivalent to KDP, what KDP is to Amazon. So essentially what you're gonna be doing is hiring a narrator to narrate your book and then convert it into an audiobook. You can either hire a narrator through an audition. This is uh, primarily what we use in order to find one. Um, or you can actually go onto the ACX platform and scroll through the hundreds of narrators there are and send them a message and offer them a contract to narrate your book. So you then want to agree on a per finished hour rate. We never pay more than $100 per finished hour. So for example, if your book was three hours long, which is kind of roughly what our books are, and a per finished hour rate of $100, that will be a total of $300, which is actually a very affordable price to have a whole brand new income um, coming in. So once you've agreed on the price, you can then send off your manuscript to them to start narrating. Uh, it will usually take them between two to three weeks uh, to narrate your book and then upload the files to ACX, at which point you want to listen fully to the audio, check for audio quality. This is really important. You don't want any crackles or any, or any muffles at all. It wants to be very clear and crisp. Um, any narration mistakes, there will be some narration mistakes. That's natural because they are human. Uh, so if there are any, just ask them to correct it and they'll be able to correct it fairly easily. Um, any background noise as well. And once you've done this, you can then approve it your end once you're ready. Um, and then once you've approved it, ACX will then usually take around about 10 business days to approve at their end, at which point it's then uh, approved and then live on Audible and basically selling as an audiobook. So the process of actually converting a book into an audiobook is actually very, very simple, but um, a lot of people either don't, they don't know or they don't know how to do it. And this is a reason why the competition on Audible is so much lower compared to on Amazon um, and just a massive opportunity massive market to get into all right sweet so yeah now that we've gone through this whole presentation I'm sorry if it's been super long but hopefully it's been helpful but hopefully by now you should know how to publish your very own first book on Amazon so 
basically just use everything we've given you to go out and do that. Obviously, you want to make sure that you're publishing high quality books. And as it says here, if you're publishing high quality books in niches that have high demand and low competition, then you're definitely going to be on your way to making money. So the most important thing as well out of everything that we could tell you right now is that most people are not going to take action. So that is the most important thing is just to take action because a lot of people who see this and have all this information are not necessarily going to do anything with it. So just by simply taking action and getting started, you're going to be way better off than most people. And if you want to see really serious about self-publishing, then you need to know the full process. Obviously, this is a general overview of the main steps, but honestly, if we're going to go into all the detail that we uh, would like to, it would probably go on for like five or six well, hours and hours so and hours, hours, wouldn't it? Um, so that, as I said, there are several other things to be aware of in the self-publishing process. So if you're serious about building your own Amazon KDP business from the ground up, um, then do check the link that we pinned in the comments. We've created a part two to this particular video. It kind of leads on from this with more information, more detail about the process um, and actually how you can get started uh, taking it from zero, hopefully to 1K a month, then up to 5K, 10K, etc. So uh, check that out. And I guess, yeah, hopefully you found that helpful, guys. I know it's been a long one. Sorry <laughs> if it's gone on a little bit too long. Um, but that at least gives you an overview of the whole process and the process, all the parts to um, each and every one of our publishing um, steps that we use to publish our own books. And yeah, if you have any other questions about what we've talked about in this video, like anything that's maybe unclear or something you just want a little bit more help with, feel free to pop those in the comments and we will get back to you guys. Yeah, see you in the next video. Bye guys. Bye.